Welcome to another episode on strategy. And today we're going to cover chapter number four. So chapter number four is about, let's make this a little smaller, okay. Chapter number four is about companies' resources. Uh, it's the basically the internal environment. Chapter number three was the external environment, and this one is about the internal environment. So let me just give you a quick preview of what this chapter is about, or quick overview. Um, so any, any company has resources, right? Resources is, it could be physical resources, such as the buildings and you know, the factories, computers uh, or financial resources like money, the ability to borrow money, uh, ability to raise money or other technological resources. They could have patents or uh, trademarks, copyrights, things like that. So these are all resources. Now resources by itself, again, the, the whole goal is to make sure that the company is competitive. Uh, that's the whole goal, company makes money. It's profitable, everybody makes money. So um, the resources are good, but the way you combine those resources gives you capabilities. Uh, so resources you have, let's say, you know, star scientists, but you know, they're not being used, nothing, you know, they're just sitting out and doing nothing. Uh, then that resource is not being converted into a capability. So, but if you were to use those, you know, star scientists, really important, you know, smart people in your company and put them to good use, uh, like provide resources for them, money or technology or whatever it is that they need. And then these uh, star people come up with great, you know, inventions, discoveries, uh, patents for your company, then that's great. So resources, what the company has, capabilities is how it uses, it combines the different resources, money, scientists, all of that to come up with certain capabilities or competencies uh, that could be used to make money. And a related concept to capabilities is dynamic capabilities, meaning that you have, it's good to have capabilities, but if your capabilities remain stagnant, then they are not good because your competitors can beat you um in the marketplace so dynamic capabilities are all right this dynamic capabilities are the capabilities that evolve or change as the external environment changes then the next item we have is competitiveness so how do we find out if the company is competitive now before we do that we have to do and you already know this is do a SWOT analysis, meaning you look at the company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. By the way, this, so strengths and weaknesses is internal to the company. Opportunities and threats are external. That's how you come up with your SWOT analysis. And so let's say you find out, you know, you have your resources, you have capabilities. And then how do you know that those capabilities are giving you competitive advantage? So let's dive into the chapter and let's dig deeper. Now, before we do that, let me just give you, uh, you know, last a few days ago, uh, I saw the movie, The Greatest Showman, uh, you know, P.D. Barnum. So now this chapter is about internal resources. All of you also have internal resources, meaning, you know, you are getting this education plus you may or may not have financial resources to start your own business or to do anything. So, but let me just tell you a little bit about this, The Greatest Showman, uh, you know, P.D. Barnum, and what he was talking about, I mean, the, the movie is, I mean, the, the movie is good. Um, the part that I liked is, in towards the end, like his uh, building, the building that he has his circus in is actually burned. So uh, he doesn't have a place to perform his shows. That's when he gets the idea of using a tent to have his circus, basically. So it didn't, you know, the, the fact that his burning build burned down didn't actually stop him from doing what he wanted to do. 
Um, so that that's what I want you to be. I mean, you know, there are two types of R's in life. One is a reason or another is results. So you want something that is an awesome result rather than, you know, look for reasons, basically. So even though his burn, building burned down, he didn't, you know, use it as an excuse or as a reason. He used that as an opportunity to find something uh, that would help him better. Uh, that's how the idea of tent, circus in a tent came by. And the other thing is, even in his video, in, his, in the movie, he uh, talks about, oh, you know, the, the name circus. Actually, uh, one of the critics said that the show was terrible and it's a circus, so he ran with that name, circus. Uh, so again, there is that, uh, the ability not to let anything weigh you down, but using that as a resource to help you get better. And here is something that I also want to point out. Look around you, you know, just, just look around. And whatever you see, look at, look at the man-made objects, basically. Whatever you see, somebody had to dream of it. Like the tall buildings that you see in Houston, the, the highways and, you know, big fancy houses and cars and everything is, anything that is good is, or everything, you know, anything that is man-made, somebody had to dream about it, okay? Then, then they had to act on it to make it happen. So if you want something, if you want your dreams to come true, if, you know, if there's something that you really, really want in life, uh, you know, make sure you dream big. And then you have to act on it, meaning you have to put in efforts. It's, it's good to dream, but at the same time, you have to you know, put some, take some action towards it. So a classic example is this person, you know, P.D. Barnum. He had big dreams and he made it happen. And along the way, and also since we have this Olympics going on, um, I read in, you know, I, I go through these things. What makes these Olympic athletes so successful? And there are a few key points. And one of the things is setback is inevitable meaning things are going to go wrong i mean whatever's going to go wrong murphy is well and alive it's going to happen but you should not use it as an excuse but use it as a way to launch from that or use it as an opportunity and if anything you know and in the previous video i had said there's no such thing as failure it's only feedback so uh, that's how the olympic athletes use that all right, so let's jump into this uh, chapter. And okay, these are actually good questions to ask. So when you're analyzing your company, you could use some of these questions to see what's going on with the company. And again, use the you know use the questions that are relevant to your company. I don't expect you to answer each and every one of these questions, and it doesn't need to be in this format. You could incorporate that into the very into your uh, presentation as to how the strategy is working uh, so that would be the competitiveness and you know there are other questions to so go through them the most one important is this what issues are important you know you kind of rank them and then go up over the ones that are more significant So uh, as I had mentioned in the earlier chapters also, we're not gonna cover everything. We're just gonna uncover a few key ideas. And look at this, this is the definition, resource, this is resource, this is capability. And many a times, if you read the definition, by the time you're finished reading the definition, you probably don't even remember what it is. So that's why, sorry, I, I always say to come up with your own words to explain it and then come up with an example uh, to explain what you're talking about. And as I mentioned, so these resources can be in different categories, uh, tangible and intangible, tangible resources, all the physical resources. Quick question, are humans or employees, are they tangible resource or intangible? Uh, intangible are resources that you cannot touch. Tangibles are the ones you can touch and feel. Okay. Uh, by the way, it's a joke. So humans are actually intangible resource because try touching humans <laughs> and you'll get sued. But anyway, the reason that people or employees are intangible resources, it's actually not 
the employee, but it is what is in their head that is that gives you the competitive advantage. So the CEO of Infosys uh, is an Indian company. He said that the most important asset in my company walks out the front door every day and I cannot do anything about it. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's gonna come back next day or not. So he was obviously referring to the employees. So in this day and age of uh, knowledge-based economy, uh, what's, what's inside people's mind is a lot more powerful or a lot more important than your physical infrastructure. Okay, so when you are looking at a capability, you wanna find out if the capability is, gives you, is a source of competitive advantage or not. And the way you find out is this is the test. So this test is also called so V is, stands for valuable, rare, inimitable, and non-substitutable. Valuable means simple, you should be able to make money off of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, rare is if everybody has that capability, then you don't have an advantage, uh, you can make money off of it. But let's say the resource you have is valuable and it's rare, but if it's easy to copy, then again, you don't have a source of competitive advantage. At best, you would have a temporary advantage until your competitors copy what you're doing and then you don't have an advantage more. So that's why it should be difficult to copy. And at the same time, there should not be any substitutes available for this. So let me give you an example. Let's say if, the, you know, first example, let's just say self-checkout uh, Walmart, Target, everybody has it. So does it pass this test? Okay, self-checkout. Um, it's very easy for anybody to copy this. Uh, so that's why it is. it may give you a temporary advantage, but it's not a source of permanent advantage. But let's say if your advantage is based on something that is really, really, you know, passes this test, and that is, uh, let's say, you know, you have some patents or you have some star scientists or some really smart people in your company, then it would pass this test and you would be able to make lots of money based on that until, you know, I mean, you know, until those technologies or those concepts are relevant because no advantage is permanent. Okay, whatever advantage, think about Polaroid. Instant pictures, competitors, then couldn't beat them, but the technology changed. So Polaroid no longer valid because you have digital cameras. Make sure, you know, when it passes this test, that means you have a competitive advantage. And any advantage you have is gonna be temporary at best uh, because there's nothing permanent, things change, so. Right, uh, then there's another concept over here. Core competence is, you know, it's good to have competencies, but core competencies is the ones that give, you know, are the important activities that your company does. Um, and distinctive is something that is performed at a high level of proficiency. So we're gonna look at core competence in just a bit and give you some more examples. And we talked about the dynamic capability, SWOT analysis. Now, one of the ways you could do this, uh, find out if a company is competitive is you look at, you do their value chain analysis and benchmarking tools you use. So let's look at what the value chain looks like. So value chain is divided into primary and secondary activities or support activities. Um, and by and large, this kind of map holds true for most of the companies, uh, but that doesn't mean that it holds true for every company. Let's just say if you were to pick a company uh, such as ADP, okay? I don't know how many of you know, they are mostly into payroll, so payroll would be under, let's say, general administration, sort of HR over here. So this, it shows that it is a support activity, but for ADP, because that's how they do their business, it is actually their primary activity. So for the most part, this is good. This, what you see is good. But for, depending upon the company, the primary and the support activities could change. Okay? Uh, and the goal of this is this. Because in, in this day and age, it's so easy for companies to move their operations worldwide, uh, 
that's why the competition is extremely difficult. That's why profit margins are very, very important. That's why any activity that is not crucial to the company or anything that they can get done cheaper, most likely they're going to get it done from outside the company. Now, if you look at supply chain management, most companies actually outsource this part. Uh, even a company, you know, like uh, actually, if you look at Walmart, Walmart is pretty good at managing their supply chain. That's why they are um, they are very competitive. So this function, supply chain management, is uh, has become extremely critical in making a company competitive. And sometimes the company could do the supply chain themselves or it could give it to uh, FedEx or UPS. Now, FedEx and UPS, these days, they don't say that they're delivery companies. They actually market themselves as supply chain company, meaning they're managing your business end to end. You know, you don't have to worry about getting the raw materials and getting them, you know, processed and shipping the products to the customers. Most of those activities actually are handled by uh, UPS FedEx. Even Toshiba laptop, uh, I found out recently that when, if you do send it back for warranty, if there are any issues, it actually goes into, I think, I believe it's a UPS or a FedEx facility. And there are engineers that are actually working on it. It's not Dell that is, or sorry, Toshiba that's servicing it. It's actually one of the delivery company that is servicing that. So, um, so value chain analysis is extremely important. If, if you can do something in-house, cheaper you do it if you can get it done from outside cheaper then you get it done from outside but here's the other here is one aspect of it if the activity is source of core competency or if it is the source of competitive advantage or if it is strategically important to the company then do not outsource it keep it in-house all the important activities and also if the support activity is actually an activity that is very important to the primary activity. Let's just give an example of a company, computer company. And computer company, actually product R&D would be a primary activity. So computer company comes up with different softwares. So that is a core activity that the company does. And the secondary activity is actually testing of that software. But if they were to outsource testing of the software to some other company, the other company would kind of know what the company is working on. And sometimes companies don't want their, you know, anybody to know what products they are working on. So even though testing of the software is a secondary activity, they may keep it inside. They actually should keep it inside. So this way competitors or other parties are not aware of what the company is up to. Okay? So that's the supply chain part or the value chain rather. And here is an interesting, you know, just look at the numbers basically. You won't be able to see my pretty face, but it's okay. <laughs> All right, uh, I try to also keep your face uh, so this way, you know, uh, people kind of relate to you a lot better versus just looking at a PowerPoint. So if you look at this, this is just an example polo shirt, women's polo shirt. Uh, the retail is this store. This is the cost to the company. This is the wholesale markup. And this is the retail markup over here. And if you look at these, uh, most of the, the highest cost is this. See, that's why most of the companies are producing in China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and all of those countries to get the labor cost down. If you look at, this is a significant cost. It's like almost 30% of 33% of 30% uh, of this uh, total cost. This is over here. Now you know why most of the products are done in China. Actually, if you look at, you know, I, I mentioned that in the other chapter, external environment, the reason we do so much business with China is, of course, the low labor cost, plus, you know, they are able to produce goods at an acceptable quality and the turnaround time is pretty good. Other main important reason is that the currency, Chinese yuan and US dollars are pegged. And, you know, the other chapter I showed you, but I'll share again uh, as to. If you look at the chart for um, for the 
dollar, and I mentioned this to you earlier, is the dollar has moved so much, or it moves so much, and like in, in one of the, I'll, I'll show you in a bit about what the profit margins of companies are, and you'll, you'll get a better picture as to why the exchange rate fluctuations are so important. So here's the US dollar. And uh, look at this. So let's just make it even a longer term time frame. Okay. So, and again, uh, if you look at this, as I'd mentioned earlier, also started from 80, uh, and this is sometime around 2014 and mm, about sort of a year and a half or so, it went from 80 to 100 right here, okay? So that is a 25% change in currency. And as I had said, if you, if US is, if, if there's a manufacturer in the US that is making products, it is bad for them because the currency has become stronger. When the currency becomes stronger, it is bad for the exporters, but it is good for the importers. And there is not that much that a company can do when there are such huge fluctuations. Now look at this. This is a fluctuation in the other direction, from 105, close to 103, to about 88. Um, that's another 20% drop right there, 20% right here. And let me show you why this these percentages are so important. Let's go to, now let's pick a company. I'll, you know, let's just say if you were to pick, I know you can't pick, so I'm just gonna pick, say if I were to pick Walmart. Okay. So we are picking Walmart over here. Okay, perfect. Now, take a guess as to what Walmart's profit margins are. Okay. Think about it. Okay, so you have a number in your mind. Let me show you. Walmart's profit margins are right here, 2.31%. Uh, isn't that shocking? And plus operating margin is 4.51 right here. Uh, I should actually open this in the other one so I could show you or mark on it basically. Okay, sometimes. All right, while it is coming up, so, okay, so this is what I wanted to show you. Just wanted to mark it, so this way it's easier for you to understand. 2.31 is the profit margin. Uh, some reason the pen is not, okay, now it should work. 2.31 is the profit margin and operating margin. Accountants, make sure you check this uh, or tell me what the difference between these two is. So if a company's profit margin is 2%, two, barely 2.5%, two what would this thing do to that company? Look at this, the currency is fluctuating so much. If it is going down, actually, it's awesome for a company like Walmart because it's importing sort of stuff. No, I'm sorry. Uh, if it is like this, this is good for Walmart or even for a company, for importers, anybody that is importing strong currency is good. Anybody that is exporting strong currency is good for them. But for most, I mean, so depending. So look at this. Um, 
Walmart, I mean, the profit margins are very low of most of the companies these days because of cutthroat competition. So that's why currency fluctuations is very important. That's why most of the business is done, most of the manufacturing is done in China because Chinese currency is pegged to the US dollar, okay? Uh, what do I mean by pegging the currency to the US dollar? is let's see where did my icon go uh, all right i found it over here okay so pegging off the us dollar to chinese currency means as the dollar goes up or down the chinese currency moves equally so manufacturers in china don't have to worry about currency fluctuations in the us so you producing in china is as good as producing in the us meaning from a currency standpoint, okay? That's what I mean. All right, and uh, let me show you, you know, you, you probably might be thinking, oh, okay, Walmart is a crappy company, so their profit margins are low. Let's just look at another company. Uh, and most of the people when in class, when I asked them about a company that could have a high profit margin, most of the time people uh, come up with a name as Apple. See, I'm switching between screens and that sometimes can make it a little challenging. Okay. It should pop up. Okay, it's it's working. So so while this is coming up, try to think about what would be the profit margin for Apple. Have a number in mind. <laughs> Most of the students, when I ask them about profit margins for Apple, they typically give a number that is 100%, 200%, 300%. So I'm asking for a profit margin <laughs> in percentages. Okay. All right. So go ahead and think about what number you have in mind. Okay, so it's coming up. How surprised will you be if I showed you that the profit margin of Apple is not that high? Okay, come on. <laughs> so technology. Okay, Apple, we got it. Cool, all right, awesome. So even Apple's profit margins, look at Apple's profit margins right here, 21% and operating is 27, close to that. So even Apple could get killed in those currency fluctuations, okay? So keep in mind, that's the reason why most of the stuff is in China because the currency, US currency and Chinese Yuan are pegged. So Chinese currency goes up and um, US currency goes up and down, same thing happens to the Chinese currency. So the producers, manufacturers in China are not affected by the Chinese uh, or by the US fluctuations of US dollar. But that, so you must be thinking then why can't other countries do that? You know, is China the only smart country? Well, in order to have the peg, you have to buy tons of treasury, the US treasury. There are other things that the company has to do, but that's one of the things that they have to do, which is buying US debt. So most of our debt is financed by China and there are other countries that do that too. Anyway, let's go back to the chapter over here. And so as I was showing you, uh, the labor cost, that is the most important component or the most expensive component that's why most of this production is done in China. Okay, all right. So let's go through the other parts. Okay. okay. So that's why um, the value chain is important. You find out where you can co save cost and that's where you get your uh, activities done. Now benchmarking is you're looking at different activities and you kind of provide a value to that activity. 
And based on the weight that you give to that activity, you decide whether uh, you are competitive in that activity or not. So let me show you this over here. And you're comparing your company with competition and you give a score. So looking at this, you know, you, there are two companies that are below your company or less than your company in terms of competitiveness. And there are two that are above. So, you know, ABC company is kind of in the middle. And if you see relative, relative cost position is the most important. So this activity, you know, you come up with the key success factors over here and then you give them a weight and that's how you find out if your company is competitive. If it's not competitive in certain aspect, uh, you know, this can provide you um, a good understanding of where it's not competitive so you can make uh, changes to that. Okay, all right, so let's quickly recap. Okay, that's, uh, let's go back to the first one. So let's quickly do a recap of this. So basically a company has resources. Resources is whatever the company's, uh, the money that it has, uh, the factories, uh, patents, technology, whatever that is resource. And the resource uh, does not have as much meaning until it is combined, until you combine the resources into something that could be put to some use. So using or combining those resources gives the company capabilities. And the capability that can change according to changes in the external environment is a dynamic capability. That's ideally what you want. You want it to be able to uh, change as the time changes. And this, any capability that passes this test, and if you've forgotten what this is, I highly encourage you to watch this video again and find out what that VRIN is. So that gives you, if the, if the capability passes this test, then it gives you competitiveness. And there are two things that you could do is value chain analysis and benchmarking. Now value chain analysis is used to find out what activities you need to keep in-house, what activities you need to outsource. And benchmarking kind of gives you how competitive your company is based on certain key factors. All right, so thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in other videos. I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, your midterms are coming up soon. So, and you should be able to register for the midterms, by the way, you know, it should, you should uh, have access to that. Anyway, so thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in future videos.